And when you're doing reads, you're bound to take some cache misses. Even if you, you design the perfect system, there are going to be cache misses. And an interesting number that I came across somewhere is that even if you have 1% one per, one per cache misses, which is pretty low actually, you take a hit of 10% in performance. So um, let's look at this. So DRAM always we feel that it is very performance oriented and people have been using DRAM from a very performance optimization point of view. But it can be cheaper. So we can characterize a storage system based on two things. One is how much data it can store, and secondly, what's the query rate. Uh, this graph shows those two features on the y and the x-axis, and it is showing you what's the lowest TCO. TCO is the total cost of ownership, and this was a metric published in SOSP 2009 by Anderson et al. Uh, total cost of ownership is basically the capital cost and the cost of using it, the total energy cost of using it for three years. So it seems it's kind of obvious that if you have really large data sets and low query rates, this is the cheapest. For both of the things in the mid-range, flash, flash is cheapest, but if you have really high query rates and smaller data sizes, then DRAM seems to be cheaper. However, over the years, the cost of hardware is going down. We are able to store more and more data for lesser cost. But the I.O. ops are not increasing. So these lines are bound to move upwards, and hence DRAM will become most cost effective for larger and larger data sizes. Now that I have sort of explained the motivation behind using DRAM, uh, why do we keep talking about low latency? I think that HPC is probably a crowd which already believes in low latency, so I don't need to go through it, but let's do it anyway. So in traditional applications, you had a program that you compiled, loaded its binary, all the data was also in the local memory, and the application could get to the data extremely fast. They were all in the same machine. It could do really data-intensive computations. But what happens here is that we are bound by the throughput of a single machine. As the web came along and we had to support millions and billions of users and the data got larger, this was not a viable option anymore. So what a web application typically looks like is that we have a bunch of application servers in the data center and a bunch of storage servers which store all the data. So the interesting aspect here is that the data and the computation have now been separated through a network. That increases the latency by a couple of orders of magnitude if you look at the difference. So over the past couple of years, we have been able to scale the storage, the capacity of storage, but not the data access rates. So for example, Facebook, uh, this is I think from a couple of months ago, said that they could make only 100 to 150 requests per page that they generated. Because if they do any more than that, then it will take a couple of seconds to generate a page. And I'm sure no web user will be happy to wait for a couple of seconds for a page to come up. They'll just go to another page instead. So we in Drown Cloud want the best of both worlds. We want a really good scale while providing the latency as low as possible. We want to drive it down to be as close to this as possible. Obviously, we can't reach there, but as close to that as possible. And as I mentioned earlier, we are hoping that this will enable a new class of applications that couldn't exist today. So a little bit an overview of RAM Cloud. This is what a RAM Cloud system we believe would look like. Uh, where RAM Cloud is a software package that would run on off-the-shelf commodity hardware. So that's one point that all of these machines are commodity hardware. Now we have a bunch of application servers and storage servers. Storage servers, each of them have two components. There is a master and there is a backup. Master is the one that takes in your data, stores it in DRAM, and that's where all the client requests go, whether it's a read request or a write request. They all go to the master. Backups store data on a secondary storage. We are currently using desk. It could also be flash or some other form of secondary storage, which stores the redundant copies for all the data that is stored in disks in DRAM and the masters. 
the client applications access RAM Cloud through a library, which hides the distributed nature of RAM Cloud, and all the data is accessible uniformly as if it were all located on one giant server. Then, apart from that, we have a centralized configuration management system called the coordinator. The coordinator is not involved in most operations, so if a client wants to do a read or write, they don't have to go through it. The coordinator manages the really high level operations. For example, if you want to create a table, or if a server is joining in the cluster, or is getting out of the cluster, if a server crashes, you have to start the recovery for the server. So the coordinator is involved in those high level operations, but is not involved in the normal operation. Um, to just quickly walk through what happens in a normal operation when a client starts up. So say a client or a compute node starts up, it will first talk to the coordinator, it will get the configuration for the cluster, so now it knows where each table of the data is located, and then when it wants to do a read or write request, it can look up its local table of where the data should be located and talk to that master directly. And this is all managed by the uh, a library, by the way, so the client doesn't have to do it explicitly. And in case the library realizes that for some reason the configuration has changed and it has an outdated map, it will go to the coordinator, ask it for the latest information, and refresh its local cache. Um, the other thing to note here is that in the data center network, we're assuming that a few years down the line we will have really fast networks. Uh, which we mentioned here, we could provide five microsecond round trip times and we would have full bisection bandwidth. We are trying to emulate that in our cluster right now, but we believe that this would be commonplace in a few years. But I guess this is already commonplace for HPC applications, at least if not in your storage part, then in some other parts. So, our data model is currently a very simple key value data model with multiple tables. So a client can create any number of tables that they want, and each table can have any number of objects. Each object has three parts. There is a key, a version, and a blob. Now, blob is basically data. It's a value. The meaning of blob is basically it's uninterpreted, so you could just store a big number, or you could store JSON for all we care. It could be anything at all. And we support some basic operations, which is obvious like a read and a write request, and then the conditional write, which is kind of interesting. So uh, in the conditional write, I can provide the table key and the value, as well as a version. And the value will be written only if the current value of that object, as it is right now, when the write request comes in, matches the version that we have mentioned over here. So conditional write is an operation that we believe could be used as a primitive to build higher level operations, higher level atomic operations. And uh, then we have delete. And we have enumerate, which can be used to scan the entire table. So basically, as of now, we are extremely similar to a key value store, except we also provide tables, which is not common. And we provide these two special functions. But we believe that this is a very bare bones data model, and this is not where we aim to be finally. This is not one of the goals of RAM Cloud, and one of the extremely interesting research areas for the future, which is kind of close to my heart, so I might take that up next as my project, and hence would like feedback from you too, is to explore richer data models. So if we provide asset properties and, say, relational database model, everybody will be very happy. But there is evidence that as soon as we start going to complex data models, the scalability and the performance get impacted. There's evidence that it's not possible to have both at the same time. So what we want to figure out is how high up can we push the data model, how much benefit can we provide to the clients while not hitting the ceiling of scalability and performance bottleneck. So this is one thing that we'd like to explore in the future, and we'd like to hear more from you as well. So moving on. Durability and availability. I have been claiming this all along. We stored the data in DRAM, but we provide you the durability and availability of replicated disks. Um, how do we do that? First of all, we have two goals. While doing this, we do not want to impact performance. We cannot have the performance limited by the I.O. performance of a disk. It should be limited only by the DRAM and by the network. And secondly, we don't want to increase the cost more than we need to. So the cost and the energy should be as low as possible. 
So one of the blunt, obvious approaches would be to keep three copies of data in TMAP so that we, if one server crashes, we can get data from the other one. First of all, that gets extremely expensive because DRAM is expensive. Keeping one copy of data itself would be expensive. So that's a bad thing. And secondly, what if there is a power outage? You've lost all your data. So we need to solve that problem somehow. The RAM cloud approach is to keep just one copy in DRAM and we put all the backup copies on disk. And that means that our durability is almost free in terms of cost because, well, this cost compared to DRAM is almost free. Now, this results in two important issues. First of all, if we are putting backups on disk, don't we have to do synchronous IOs during write and hence? Our first goal is not met. And secondly, once a server crashes, once a master crashes, what do we do? Our data is unavailable. Do we start servicing requests from the backups? We said we don't want to do that. Or now, is there one server which reconstructs the entire data and the data is unavailable in the meanwhile? So let's go through them one by one. So first of all, the synchronous disk IO issue. This is what we do when a write request arrives. So a write request is arriving from a client and it comes into the master. And the master will write the data in its own memory, it will copy the data in its own memory, and then it will send copies of that to the backups. In this figure, I have shown three backups, but that's configurable. We can have multiple backups too. The backups will store it in their own DRAM and then return back to the master and say we have stored it. Note that they are not going to their disk, they are only storing it in their DRAM right now. And the master responds back to the client saying, we have your data, it's safe now, you can go ahead and do your own thing. So in this while, we can see that it's only been RAM writes that have been done, so it's really fast. However, this data from the RAM needs to somehow get to the disk. So a backup will keep on buffering requests. It keeps on writing them to a buffer. And after a little, little bit while, uh, we're currently doing this in eight megabyte segments. So after a little bit while, it will flush all of that uh, data from its buffer to the disk. So that's how it ultimately gets to the disk. And this format of sequentially collecting data and then flushing it just naturally lent into a log structured system. So we have a log structured system for the backups. But we also do it pervasively, so we have the same system for the memory as well. And we use a lot of techniques from the log structured file system LFS that many of you might have heard of. And uh, another thing to mention over here is that when it is being written to its in-memory log, now it's a log, uh, we also construct an entry in the hash table, which helps us quickly locate where each data is located. And um, later on, if any data is overwritten, because in log, you do not really overwrite data, you keep on appending data to the log, we have mechanisms to do the garbage collection, which we call log cleaning. Uh, and we can go into more details of how that's done if any of you is interested. Just bring that up later. So moving on to our second issue over here, which is what about after crashes? What do we do? So. You have, to you have to take the data back from the backups, you have to replay it to reconstruct the hash, and then the data will be available. So here's what happens, if a master dies, the backups, all the three backups can then send its data to the recovery master. Recovery master is the chosen new master for the old data, that's the new owner of the old data, who will replay that data and reconstruct the hash table. Now, in the meanwhile, the data is unavailable. And how long is this meanwhile? It can be quite a lot because, as you can see, there are multiple bottlenecks here. First of all, when backup is reading its log from disk, we have only three disks. So we are limited by the disk bandwidth because we have to read in all the data for a particular monster. Secondly, uh, all of the data is coming to one recovery master, so we get limited by the NIC bandwidth on the recovery master. Thirdly, it's not possible for a recovery master to replay the entire log to construct the hash table fast enough. So the data for this one master will be unavailable for a long time. But since we are relying only on DRAM storage, what we want to do is we want to make the crash recovery so fast that it's not visible to the user. So our aim is to achieve one to two seconds crash recovery. 
And our solution to that is to use scale in all ways possible. So let's see how we can do that. First of all, uh, let's handle the first bottleneck, which is how do you split your data across the backups? What happens is during normal operation, each master will divide its data into multiple segments. When it's writing its data to the log, there are multiple segments, and each of these segments get backed up to three different sets of backups. So that means that eventually, every backup in the cluster will have some part of your data. So when you are replaying after the server has crashed, you can read from every disk in parallel. So we have parallelized the task of reading from backup disks, which makes it much more efficient. And during recovery, the other way to use scale is that a coordinator goes and divides the original master, the dead master's data, into various partitions. So that's almost like a will. A machine has died, you have a will for the machine, and different possessions of it will go to different masters. So all the backups will read data corresponding to the dead master, divide it according to the partitions that have been provided now, and then it will go to the appropriate recovery master. So this, which happens during a normal operation, resolves the first bottleneck, and this resolves the second bottleneck because we are no longer limited by the NIC or by the replay performance of one particular master. So any questions at this point? Okay, I'm going to move on with that. Um, there are many, many interesting research issues in RAM Cloud that we have or are tackling right now. But uh, what I've tried to do here is provide you an extremely high level overview of some of the most uh, basic research issues. And uh, to summarize, we have, like, our goal has always been to build production quality implementation. And I'm so glad that my advisor feels that way because. Uh, a lot of projects don't actually try to build something, or in academia, most projects don't actually try to build something that can be used eventually, and our goal has always been to do that. And we think that we are sort of nearing the 1.0 level release, which means that we think that now the system might be stable enough to be used in a real application. Um, this is our current test cluster, which is kind of tiny. We are hoping to uh, use it in much larger test cases, but we have 80 servers with 24 gigabytes of memory on each, so 2 terabytes of total data. We have high-speed infinite band networking, and our current performance is that a round-trip time uh, server, uh, client to server to client for reads is 5.3 microseconds, so we're pretty happy with achieving our goal. And for writes, we have 15 microseconds. And we have designed it in such a way that we do not think that it should break as soon as we scale up, but we never know, so we'd like to find out. And most importantly, we are really interested in finding applications for our cloud at this point so that we can test the robustness and see it being used. So if any of you are really, really brave, pioneering souls who would like to work with us and do something amazing, please talk to me or anybody else on the RAM Cloud team. So, uh, is RAM Cloud right for HPC apps? I have tried to summarize some of the interesting attributes of RAM Cloud that could be of interest to any client application over here. We have already talked about most of them, but just to go over them again, we do care about durability and availability. If all you care about is just read the data, it can just go away, then maybe you can store it in a cache. Uh, we are a key value store, which provides a lot of flexibility in terms of modifying data the way you want to modify it. Uh, but this is also a thing in which we are open to researching more. So if you have ideas about higher level data models, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, we are running on commodity hardware, and we care about really low latency accesses to your data. And what we provide very well, actually, is random access to small objects. If you are accessing sequential data, or if you're accessing, randomly accessing really large chunks of data, you would be mostly limited by the network bandwidth, and you don't care where the data is located. So this is one of the major places where RAM Cloud has real benefit. To summarize quickly, uh, RAM Cloud is a general purpose storage system in which we try to achieve the RAM performance with the cost of uh, with the cost of having replicated disks and a 
RAM cache while still providing the durability and availability of having tests. I'm um, going to open up for questions now, and I have summarized some of the questions for you. Uh, this is the thing that I had put up earlier. And there is a bonus question. What if you had a magic wand, and you could bail it and ask us to change any one thing in Dracula? It might not work, because we don't know if magic exists, but what if you had a magic wand? What would you like us to change? Thank you.